to you. And that's uh, Cindy Prember from OCAD University in Toronto, Canada. And uh, they will present a talk to us. It's called How to Make a Video Game Photography. And in that talk, uh, they suggest that photography may be everywhere, but it's not everywhere in the same way. And uh, they take a look at two like different in-game photography practices, like photojournalism and amateur Ansel photography. I don't know who of you is aware of that, but there's a tool that's uh, built by the graphic cards company uh, NVIDIA that's called NVIDIA Ansel. And that actually allows you to access um, the camera of computer games and to take photographs with that. And their talk uh, begins to explore different ways photography comes to be assembled in video games. Cindy Paramba is a digital media researcher, game maker and curator. They are an associate professor that I just said and co-director of OCAD's Gameplay Lab. Uh, Cindy has presented internationally at conferences, uh, festivals, invited lectures, and uh, on topics relating to game art, curation, capture and post media practices, and interactive documentary. And um, I think apart from like uh, theoretical work, they are also very much uh, involved in like artistic work. And um, the reason why I'm so happy to have uh, Cindy joining us uh, today is that uh, the moment you start looking for uh, research on in-game photography, you have to stumble across uh, Cindy's article that I'm, I've put on the slides below from 2007, Point and Shoot. Cindy was uh, one of the first, I think in game studies, as far as I understand it, you are the very first who has addressed uh, the topic of photography in computer games. And therefore I'm extremely happy to have you here and um, hope that you will present us your talk. Hi, thank you. Uh, I am I am so excited that out of the, the possible pictures that could have ended up by by my name that it was the area 511. I know there were options and that was clearly the best option. I'm going to uh, share my screen and hopefully this works okay. Uh, hello everybody. So we can hear you and we can see I, th I can see your work. So the floor is yours, I would say. Excellent. Okay, uh, I'm going to, I tend to talk over long, so I'm going to set myself a, uh, a timer here. If it goes off and I don't know how to turn it off, my apologies. Um, not that it's a formal talk, but anyway, thank you, um, Sebastian, for such a, uh, an amazing uh, introduction. I, we, we did not plan the, the interrelations between the, the uh, introduction and the talk, but I will give everybody a heads up. You will see some of the projects that were introduced in that, um, in that introduction, again, um, again through, uh, through my talk, um, just in part, in part through, um, through happy coincidence. So, um, so, uh, so first off, I want to say how, how excited I am to Part, um, to be part of this program and to know that this program is, is going on. Uh, I have been interested in in-game photography for a very long time, um, a very, very long time, so you might say too long a time, uh, in part because I, um, I'm in general fascinated by the idea, uh, but, but by the idea and the concept of capture, why we say things are captured and how capture practices have um, kind of shape shift and take different, um, different sorts of forms. Uh, um, particularly in what we might call a, a post-media era. So I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to present a ton of, kind of, of theory overall. I actually want to talk through some specific examples in this talk, but I did think that it might be useful to give you a little bit of a sense of where, uh, of, of where I'm situating the, the work that I'm doing. So, um, so when I use the term post-media, I'm mostly um, referencing uh, po um, theory that kind of comes largely through um, largely through digital theory, so influenced by folks like Rod Manovich um, and um, Kiko Liebel. Um, and in photography specifically, um, folks like Jeffrey, Jeffrey Batch in reference to the idea of post-photography. Um, and, uh, and what I'm interested in um, is in the way that the kind of the socio socio-cultural transformations that were um, triggered in large part by the emergence of digital technologies and specifically their ability to, in a way, kind of assume a lot of other media forms 
and in doing so, kind of giving them uh, not just a, uh, te a technical transformability and mutability, although of course that's the, that's the case, but also the expectation that we can change and shift and adapt um, different different media forms, and that they're not necessarily kind of bound to um, to stable materialities the way that they might have been perceived in the past. Now, if you start to kind of delve further into, um, you know, into histories of photography, histories of captured captured media, of course, that that stability is something that, that we can kind of break down and question. To a certain extent, we've, we've always um, been constructing these these stable forms. We talk about photography like it's a single thing, and um, uh, and but also kind of but also kind of acknowledge and reference that it's always been actually a number of slightly different entangled sorts of things. And even in the cases where it seems like it's one uniform thing, uh, it, that, that uniformity often emerges through a lot of gatekeeping. So uh, a lot, you know, there's a, um, kind of an active, um, an active sense of trying to right, right size or kind of right shape photography to, to, to a particular sort, sort of um, set of practices and paradigms. Uh, now that, now with the advent of digital technologies, um, that, um, uh, that, that kind of intensity of, um, of, of, of kind of, of, of form and kind of material specificity has initially kind of started to gently dissolve and eventually kind of just, just um, dissipated into a number of different um, a different forms and practices. So um, to kind of uh, loosely paraphrase Jeffrey, Jeffrey Batch and um, photography is not, you know, it's not just one place anymore. There's not one thing we can think of as photography, it's everywhere. It has, you know, the, the balloon has burst and, um, and you know, the, the photography is filling out all over the place. So this is where I think um, Martin Hans' work is really interesting. Uh, and the way, and you know how why why I like to to um to to use some of um, some of this work to think about um, not just photography in general, but in game photography. So um so while photography and again with nods to 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 Batchen, um photography may be everywhere, but it's not everywhere in the same way. Uh, as photography starts to kind of go from being this um, this broader sense of of conventions and practices, and, um, and in some cases, you know, kind of different different technologies and, and material configurations. Um, it's uh, as it kind of goes as it as it goes through and assembles in different contexts. It um, often assembles in very specific contextual ways and forms. And some of those things, um, and those things become recognizable as photography. More because, uh, you know, more through what um, what Wittgenstein might call kind of family resemblance than they do um, by being bound or kind of being checked against a particular kind of um, kind of paradigm of, uh, of photography or the photographic. So, um, uh, so you know, we we recognize photography because these these practices and these forms and these these materials take the shape of photography, uh, but. Depending on where we're coming from, we might recognize different things, different values that are important, different materialities that are important, um, different types of conventions and practices and histories that, um, that that are important because all of these things are are situated as they're as they're reassembled. And again, that has always been the case, but it's the it's more that these different little localized photographies are increasingly way more apparent and way more transformable and, and transformable than they might have been in the past. So what I want to do is I want to kind of look through in-game photography and um, and I want to kind of highlight um, some of the different ways in which uh, you know, photography comes together, but it potentially comes together in a different way. So um, so like like photography in general, you know, Martin Hand talks about um, kind of photography through a wide number of different instances and in, in different forms. Um, but even within in-game photography, there are so many different um, shapes, even within the kind of the short time frame in, um, in which um, it's, it's kind of becoming a recognizable a practice. And some of these you might recognize from, um, from the, uh, the excellent introduction earlier. So, um, so I'm going to specifically talk about two of them. And it's mostly to highlight, again, how um, how we can kind of look at these practices 
not so much as being, you know, when I originally started writing about, um, about Indian photography, I kind of naturally took as a point of inspiration um, concepts like remediation, which comes from a, 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 a kind of early work by um, Jay Bolter and Richard Person. And, um, uh, and kind of use that as a, as, as a lens or as a means of thinking about how photography kind of manifests or instances itself in these different contexts, contexts within games. Um, and that's not, I don't think that's still in many cases a valuable lens, particularly with some of these practices that are, that are kind of clearly reperforming um, modes and practices of photography that we can see not necessarily, that we can see in different, um, in different instances and in different kind of, um, kind of configurations. But, um, but also I want to kind of to present an argument for looking at, at these as being assemblies of photography that are kind of drawing different things from different areas, you know, again, including um, values, including priorities and, and bringing those together without necessarily explicitly tying it to a photography practice that is being simulated. So these are, these are emerging practices that are um, that I almost want to think about is as, as springing up with in-game environments. And they oftentimes look like real world practices because they are linking in or networking in these different sorts of understandings, but they aren't necessarily trying to recreate them or represent them in all sorts of cases. So um, the two specifically I want to look at that I think are really interesting are uh, photojournalism. Uh, and I'm using photojournalism fairly, uh, fairly loosely. Uh, but um, but it's kind of the idea of uh, of having a uh, a kind of a, a documentary or, or reportage approach to capturing um, images from game worlds, uh, and then the second one is something that I looked at um, uh, after a bit, and that is a um, the practices that spring up around um, uh, the Nvidia Ansel uh, in-game photography platform. So I can talk, and again, that was introduced a little bit in the introduction. I can talk a little bit more about what specifically that is, um, and uh, and I think that that um, that that specific that specific context really gives um, an interesting picture of not only how these how these photographies are being assembled, but also in some cases how they are getting then um, stabilized uh, as particular things within. Specific particular forms, um, including commercial, um, commercial contexts. So, um, so let's take a kind of a quick pass through, um, through photojournalism. And then what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, a couple of both um, ways in which photojournalism uh, has kind of been remediating or representing or drawing in photojournalism practices, but then also cases where we start to see a little bit more of uh, emerging photojournalism practice that, that is kind of, that we can, that's almost better understood as being situated within um, a particular game environment. So um, Kit Shealy's work, again, came up in the, in the introduction, so I won't spend a ton of time dwelling on it. Um, this orig um, this um, work kind of began with an initial series of, series of photographs that occurred I don't want to kind of timestamp things necessarily, but this occurred roughly around 2009 um, that you know looked to recreate the aesthetics of uh, combat journalism, conflict journalism photographs within within game environments, specifically game environments that um, uh, you know centered around um, around war and conflict. Uh, and this is where we kind of first see photos like this, which you know are obvious nods, like clear aesthetic nods to um, to works by, by folks like Robert Kappa. Uh, I'm a little bit more interested in a uh, slightly more recent project uh, that she uh, that she did, which um, uh, which kind of took some of that um, some of that earlier work, including that um, uh, uh, that simulated iconic uh, capital work, kind of applied to um, to these these game images, and um, but then also engaged in um, what it means to enact the practices of photojournalism. So, um, so in this particular series, the, the idea was less to um, create versions of these pre-existing photographs, but more to, to go into these game environments and find ways in which to perform photojournalism. Um, and now they were kind of treated through, through the same sort of lens at the, at the end of the day, but it was more about, the, about, about exploring the practice and how the practice, the, the practice works within it. Um, now this, 
um, I think has a tie to uh, a couple of different projects that, um, that center on this idea of taking photojournalist practice and bringing it in um, into, into game environments. And oftentimes these projects are set up um, like specifically, um, they, I would almost describe them as media spectacle projects. So while Sheely is a, um, a kind of a, a new media artist, um, these next few projects I, I wanted to talk about are, are largely um, uh, like a new, almost news-based investigations and one, one is in fact um, a, a, a promotional work. So, um, so this one right here was a collaboration between um, uh, conflict photographer Ashley Gilbertson and, um, and Time Magazine. So it was a exploration of, of you know, what, what, what would it would look like if a uh, war photographer or a conflict photographer entered into a game with their practice, what would they be able to do? How would they feel about it? And, um, uh, and, what's, um, and this one kind of occurred roughly around, um, around 2014. So, um, uh, so what was interesting about, about this particular one is, it, is again, it sort of, it, rather than kind of emerging from, uh, from game worlds itself, it is largely about taking a practice, uh, kind of decentralizing a practice that exists in kind of a physical environment and bringing it into a, in, into a game environment and exploring the, the contrast and the conflict between, between two of those things. So, um, so this one, um, so in this particular one, the, uh, the photojournalist went into uh, The Last of Us um, Remastered, uh, tried to do the same sort of things that they would do in real, real work, world photography, exploring different um, angles, exposure, trying to get to character reactions. Um, one of the, um, and kind of reflecting on that process overall, and, and um, one of their outcomes was actually a, like a, a fairly strong dissatisfaction with the affordances of their practice within, um, within the game environment. But it also highlighted what, um, started to highlight some of the things in which photojournalism has a specific core set of, of values and practices. So, um, so when you kind of read accounts of, of, um, of Ash, from, from Ashley Wilderson on, uh, on their work within the game, uh, you, can, you can see them kind of yearning for or, or seeking, first of all, these, um, these emergent, uh, emergent moments that occur within conflict. And one of the things that they note is that um, in the particular way in which they set up this project, they often had to, they had to pause the game in order to take, um, to take particular shots. And in doing so, they took something that was a dynamic situation, which had more, um, uh, more familiarity or it had more of the shape of how their photojournalism practice would have unfolded in the real world and brought it into something which was more, which they kind of described as, as, kind of, as more um, like, um, advertising photography or professional photography practice, where you make sure things are, are staged and kind of lined up properly. Um, so a lot of the work is trying to intervene in that or to try to push back against, um, against that tendency in the way that the game is set up, to introduce moments of, um, of imperfection and um, to try to create signifiers of spontaneity within, within the work overall. Um, they weren't terribly happy <laughs> with what they could do with it. Um, this is, but, uh, uh, yeah, but as these people keep trying this, uh, trying this approach or, um, or kind of are interested in this sort of project. So this is a, this is a more recent, um, uh, I guess, iteration of this form of, of, of journalism. It's from, um, 2021 and it's actually, um, largely centered around the promotion for, um, uh, Call of Duty Vanguard, which is a recent, a recent Call of Duty game. And so what, um, so what was done for this work is that two conflict photographers, um, Sebastiano Tomata and, uh, Alex, uh, and, and Alex Potter, um, which you can see in the documentary, uh, the GIF um, from the documentary down in the bottom, were, uh, were invited to kind of use this, um, this interface. Again, you can kind of see it down in the GIF from the bottom it, to go through the, um, the, the environment and to photograph it as if they would be photographing um, things that um, they, they, they would kind of encounter as part of their regular conflict journalist um, practice. And, um, and in this case, I think what's, what's interesting is in part how the foregrounding of the practice was such a large part in contextualizing these work in these photos. So this is a promotional piece. It's meant to show um, as, a, um, as a broad rhetoric how realistic this game environment is. So realistic, you can invite 
more photographers into it, and you know their their practice is indistinguishable from the actual practice. And that's where these these photographs um, emerge from. And obviously, the photographs themselves very high dip, but very high gloss, very um, uh, very uh, showcasey of what the game can do and things that you might you might see in the, the environment uh, overall. So um, so again, kind of engaging that um, uh, that 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 aspect of uh, of practice in the work. So what I'm a little bit more interested in is works that, so these are all works that are kind of taking, um, taking external practices and, um, and bringing them into an environment. And obviously, you know, we can still understand it as photojournalism. So there is connection there. There is a, there's a similar amount. There's enough about the shape that looks familiar. Uh, in, um, uh, in other practices, there is kind of both that recognition of shape and there's also kind of what I would suggest is more of a, more of a um, engagement and acknowledgement of what um, what is unique to the game world and what could potentially be drawn out or brought out into that at, um, in terms of that understanding of, um, of of photojournalism in a game. So not just photojournalism that happens to be in a game, but in-game photojournalism. Uh, so so one project that I think kind of falls into this category is one by um, by Morton Rockford Raven, called Clear and Loading in, uh, in GTA 5. You'll notice a lot of these works um, take place in GTA 5, which is great because you can go on a tour and you can see these famous, um, these famous sites from these works. Uh, and, um, and I wanted to, to, to kind of show this one quickly um, because um, one of the interesting things about the way that um, this work is, is kind of framed and talked about is, is that it is in relation to gonzo journalism. So um, specifically, the idea that um, that by setting up fictions, you can uh, dive dive down into greater journalistic truth, rather kind of upending this or kind of a reversal of how um, journalism is often um, is often framed. So um, so in the descriptions of these works, you can see how um, uh, how Martin Rocker Raven was. Uh, was using aspects of the game environment to construct these photojournalistic images. So, for example, in the picture, um, in the larger image down down on the bottom, a car's headlights are being used to um, to actually light light the character. Um, there are other moments where they go through and they intentionally intent cause chaos, disruption, other sorts of ways in which they um, foreground the emergence that can happen in these environments to create. Um, Particular unique images, unique um, uh, uh, unique photographs within the within the environment that could um, that could trigger kind of a broader effective um, response and connection with the um, with the image itself. And again, I feel like this is a value that is part of photojournalism. So in part, being able to pull from chaos something which is a um, which is kind of a stabilized image but that still um, that still kind of unfolds into the narrative of the broader scenario the the effect of what it means to be in that um, in that chaotic space this is another um, another one so so um, and you know Alan Butler's work was uh, was talked about a little bit into in the introduction Probably one of my favorite Indian photographers, and there's a lot about this work um, that I quite that I quite like. So this one also goes into GTA um, GTA Five, and um, it highlights um, kind of on a broader sense depictions depictions of poverty within the environment, but specifically focused on uh, non-player characters, like NPCs within the games. And these characters are solely in the game for instrumental purposes. A lot of the, um, the marginalized characters that appear as N N NPC in these games, NPCs in these games, aren't even really instrumental to the gameplay. They're kind of their local flavor. They're meant to make the environment seem real or, or alive or, or lived in. Um, so they're, they're additionally, they're re-marginalized within the game environment as well. Uh, but obviously, you know, they are, um, they are designed, uh, you know, they are, they are meant to represent um, kind of the, ex the experience, the, a very, a very thin slice of, of um, marginalized person's experience as much as you can kind of integrate it into what is essentially an AI, a bot, a bot form. Um, but, um, but what Butler does or how Butler talks about this work is, um, is in ways that don't necessarily just center on um, on what these images show us in terms of um, of real images of poverty or real um, images 
of, um, of, of marginalized people in, in, uh, in Los Santos and obviously in, um, in um, California and wherever the real places where these, these cities would be set or where these games would be set. Um, but um, but also the bots themselves, how the bots how the bots interact, um, obviously the experience of being a bot in this environment, um, the um, you know in part of like what it uh, what the bot has been designed to showcase, obviously, but then also public response to um, to, to these images um, as they are posted on uh, on the Instagram platform. So um, one of the um, so um, so what's nice is that it um, it kind of does a dual serves a dual purpose of engaging with the materiality of the digital world as well as being a surrogate for um, uh, um, for the for the for the real world world in terms of this photographic engagement. It's kind of situated more internally than it is taking a practice from uh, from the outside. One of my favorite anecdotes um, about this work um, or a favorite stories that come from come from comes from Butler is how um, because the images are posted on Instagram, Instagram has its own series of bots that go through and identify images and kind of upvotes them and, um, or you know, gives them gives them little, little likes or hearts um, while that work kind of was, a, that was the main mechanic of Instagram. And, um, and, so, and so they were describing the interplay between these bots that were doing the liking and these bots that were in the game environment themselves. Uh, and sadly, there's there's really nothing. There's not a there was not a ton that's kind of that's kind of deep there. It's not something that, that kind of commonly occurs. It's not it's not the the robot AI uprising we've heard so much about. Um, but there's something really evocative, um, and uh, just kind of as as you know, like a piece of speculation about these closed loop systems that could potentially be enacting photography. Um, and I think that that's in part of why I find that fascinating is because um, so many. Or certain types of photographic practices um, do have this um, uh, this underlying um, this underlying rule based value to structure, and that's kind of how I want to transition into kind of my next um, my next my next instance, my next in game photography. Uh, and that's taking a little bit, that's taking a closer look at a an in game photography tool. Um, uh, well, specifically, you'd probably describe it as more of a more of a platform um, called NVIDIA Ansel. Now, NVIDIA is a uh, primarily a graphics card maker. Uh, they released um, they released Ansel in uh, in the spring of 2016, and the idea behind um, and what it what it is is an in game photography tool. Now, there's a couple of different parts of it. One of them kind of ties into developers so that they can um, Integrate into their game, but for, um, photographic practices, and then obviously there's a tool set for um, for players to be able to go through and use these tools to create um, in-game um, photographs. And the idea behind them is to create is that they present a um, a interface which ostensibly kind of simulates using using a camera within an environment. But I'm going to show a little bit of the interface, and um, and that's um, that's com that's complicated overall. Um, and this, these tools that sit within in ecology. So they, so you know, there is this, um, uh, you know, the player side tools in which they use to take the images. There is the developer side where they can determine what access players have to the game itself in order to, to, to take the images. There is NVIDIA, which of course is designing the tools and can hard code in the parameters that fit the things that they want to see within game photography. And there are, um, there's a social media um, platform which is kind of Instagram style way for players to kind of show and um, integrate their, um, their, their game practices. So when, um, when Ansel launched, uh, you know, it launched with a, with a fair amount of fanfare and a great deal of very, um, uh, very kind of pro framing rhetoric that was kind of meant to situate how this tool relates to Indian photography, what Indian game photography is. And so this is just a quick idea. It's honestly, it, it is a model of everything that they think game players could want from photography. But, um, but when you kind of go through and you start to tease out what the tool actually does and the community that was actually engaged with it, the types of practices that it supports more closely align with amateur photography. Um, and to some cases, there's some, there's potentially some overlap with professional photography. Now, I don't, I don't use, I use amateur, amateur photography kind of more specifically in the way that, that um, uh, uh, 
uh, in the way that we might kind of think um, think about um, uh, things like photo clubs, things like the photo contests, like that that history and tradition of people who are engaging in uh, in mindful photography that is meant in some way, in ways to kind of show what they can what they can do with the camera and how well they understand photographic practice. So not necessarily people who are coming from a fine art context, not people who are um, snapshotters, kind of everyday users of non-professional cameras. The DSLR market is like particularly oriented towards this group. And Ashley Tickentail and Love Manovich actually did, did some interesting work framing um, a big chunk of this as being better described as competitive photography. So it's photography where the, the photographic images are meant to, first of all, showcase a certain degree of techno mastery, um, that you know how to use a camera and you understand the rules of photography and you can instance them in images that are, that are correct, um, that are the, the right way in which you take a good picture. Um, but then also structures surrounding this. Again, if you kind of think about things like photo clubs or both photo contests, and structures that evaluate this and validate this for people so that you take a photograph and your photograph demonstrates excellent composition and that you understand how a complicated camera works and that you put, that you put this forward to an audience and that this audience can, um, can tell you, yes, that work is the best one that we have seen. You are the winner of photography. Um, so I want to kind of set that as kind of a context for this, this flavor, this, this type of this shape of photography. Um, and when you go through, you can see how the tool itself has evolved to better target this audience. So I feel like back at this stage, they're kind of just throwing everything at the wall and trying to see what sticks. You know, that's the, you know, do you want to be shown in a gallery? Do you want fame? Do you want, do you want to be a professional? Um, you know, are you an artist? Whatever. We don't really know what you want to do with it yet. Um, you can see through the interface and how it evolves, how, how that starts to get stabilized and again, encoded right into the platform. So this is sort of the initial version of, of the interface. And there's some tools that are kind of on the side. And I would argue that they meet more of a, um, more of a snap shooter um, expectation of what you would do with a camera. So it's got kind of your, your fun filters and your vignettes and your different sorts of effects. Um, those things tend to be frowned upon within um, kind of amateur photography context because they're, they're seen as being kind of cheats, cheats or hacks or, or kind of corny. Um, uh, you know, but you can also then play around with those with the review, um, with, with the role of the camera, um, different, um, different sorts of things along these lines. Once you start getting into more recent versions, you can see that, um, that NVIDIA starts to kind of double down on, on, on targeting this like prosumer market almost of, of Indian photographers. So they start to integrate things like different, um, different kinds of modes that you would find on prosumer cameras, um, uh, you know, particularly kind of fairly expensive ones. They integrate things like here on the side, you can see show grid. Um, so they start to formalize in the rules of photography. So you can click on show grid and you can see your kind of your, your grid of thirds so that you can kind of follow the specific kind of modes of composition that they want to suggest that you are probably going to want to know in your photograph in order to make good, good photos overall. Um, they start integrating different um, types of camera simulations. So you can kind of work with different, um, uh, different models of camera. And again, kind of show how well you understand different models of camera. Um, so, and these things, again, kind of come from that amateur photographic practice, but there is another area which they draw in, which I think is just as interesting. And these are these extra game image practices that, that come um, from folks who have been working in Indian photography outside of using the ESO platform. So, um, so oftentimes, and again, I don't want to spend too much time on knowing, I'm going to start running out of time soon, um, but uh, one of the things one of the issues that, that emerges when you're capturing a game, when you're photographing a game, is that a game build is only, is, is a optimized for gameplay version of what the game is overall. Uh, the game as it exists in engine often involves, um, you know, different, you know, different sorts of access to shaders, um, specifically it involves something that's probably the most, the most coveted piece, which is free camera. The ability to take your camera and go anywhere you want to go. Now, if you play a video game, you know that often that that is a very restricted uh, element. You can't often take your camera and like move it a thousand feet in the air, 
or you know, move it behind different sorts of objects. And when you see works like that, oftentimes they've either hacked the game or they've managed to get the developer to give them the in-engine version of the game. So, um, so these practices are also rolled into Ansel, in particular the free camera. The free camera is the main thing that you get. The games that are photographed are often also frozen. So you're not capturing things as they occur dynamically, you're seeing them as they are frozen. And so a lot of times when you see images created with Ansel, um, sometimes, sometimes the developer will actually be able to enable that there are some kinds of dynamic effects unfolding in the background. Uh, but, um, uh, but those ones are, are kind of more complicated ones in which you, which you can take. And again, they display more of a techno mastery in, in knowing you can do these things. Um, so arguably the photography that you see in the social media galleries, um, like Shop by GeForce. So Shop by GeForce is the official um, kind of marketed um, NVIDIA Ansel gallery, uh, display this kinds of Ancelized photography. Um, so you can kind of see how um, the most upvoted images that are in it. So again, these, these are the ones I guess have the most points if you want to think about it that way. Um, follow uh, oftentimes follow very recognizable photographic conventions, um, uh, kind of rules of photography. They actually seldom have um, different um, different kinds of dynamic effects um, in the background because again, that's not typically how it works. The um, freezing of the game is meant to give players more control over how you frame and how you kind of stage the picture overall. So you can contrast this with the photo journalism practices that we saw before. So um, to kind of just wrap, wrap this up, what I, uh, what I want to offer or what I want to suggest is that when we talk about in-game photography, to, I want to encourage people to kind of think about um, in-game photographies, different ways in which photography is um, not just kind of remediated from existing photographic practices, but assembled that oftentimes are drawing from different um, different sorts of, again, models, values, histories, kind of socio-technical practices um, within, within the games overall. And they may, uh, you know, and what links them together is a family resemblance to, um, to photography, but that doesn't mean that the shape is, uh, that, that it's taking um, is necessarily kind of, kind of right-sizing to those, to those pre-existing um, photographic forms. Um, you can see the values of photojournalism inform its shape and the emphasis on, on these decisive effective moments pulled from emergence. Um, you can see different values in, in Ansel photography that focus on control and techno uh, techno mastery, verbal mastery, um, and, um, and in part highlight um, you know, the best parts of the commercial platform itself. Um, it's something to think about too when the, those decisions are hard coded by a commercial entity that has its own um, incentives for, for, for codifying things in the way that it does. Um, so, and as a, in a it just kind of close in a broader sense, you know, this does speak to ways in which um, uh, ways in which it kind of broader post media context that things like photography get instant, get assembled in um, in different um, different contexts, and that those those understandings can be very situated um, and they can kind of, they can be very specific to the, um, to the folks that are enacting, um, enacting these works. And that's not wrong. Um, it's kind of just, uh, it's kind of just the way it is. Um, but sometimes we, um, uh, we can, um, I would encourage people to think about these as being uh, potentially distinct in-game photographies um, rather than kind of bringing things back to a unified um, understanding or definition of what photography So um, thank you um, for hearing me out. Um, if you have any, um, any, any questions you want to discuss this, um, discuss anything further, um, here's some of my contact information. And um, yeah, I, look, uh, I look forward to, um, to hearing more. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Cindy. That was um, amazing. Is there, we have uh, some minutes for direct questions. Are there any questions in the room? Are there any questions in the chat? There's a question. So what are we gonna do is like, I'm gonna hear the question from the room and then I'm trying to translate it as best as, or not to translate it, but to repeat it as best as possible because I think our microphone is not lasting that long. Please. My question is for, uh, like, for... My question, uh, 
So some of you are like in game photography as like this emerging practice that you mostly related to like photojournalism. But uh, like my first kind of idea of like in game photography was marketing. Uh, this is the stuff that you saw in the back of the of the, of the cartridge when you read it. The one who had an impression, and it's still like I mean, except for the examples that you want to actually break this stuff, it's really um, often. I mean, also the case of Hassan, but right? you could argue that while like somehow critically indirect with what it shows, it also is more or less indirect marketing again for um, GTA 5, um, which kind of you know, um, kind of has a selling point when it's presenting like a, a way, which is why my, my question also, also like. Gamers use it to kind of show, oh, look how pretty the world is that I'm kind of traveling through and kind of show up. So, how is video game photography also linked to like commercial purposes, considering that like the gaming industry is growing an even bigger, like economic <laughs> layer? Thank you. Did you hear the question, Cindy, or should I, should I briefly? I, I think sure. I might, was, I might need like... you to paraphrase it for me. Okay, so the question is, I think that it's, it's good because I had the same question actually that came to, to me. So the question was um, uh, that uh, the person in the room, sorry, I don't know your name, <laughs> Lucas, Lucas in the room is asking um, um, when they were thinking about in-game photography, they were um, usually, the first thought is not exactly photojournalism, but rather like marketing, because that's, you, you automatically think of the screenshots on the back of the packages, which we hardly see anymore, but obviously we see uh, on, on the web pages, on Twitter, whenever people um, advertise games, and um, we see these uh, screenshots from games that are actually a marketing tool. And therefore the question is, and I think, and I, th it's, I, I really had the similar question, if not each in-game photograph is not also always at the same time marketing the game that it is taken in, like Grand Theft Auto or like all the other games that we've seen. I think that's, that, that is like a very short version of your, of your complex question. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it, it, it sometimes uh, I see sometimes sometimes yes and sometimes no. So when I didn't get to kind of delve delve too much like particularly into the the Ansel photography, um, there's a couple of interesting intersections there. I mean, a lot of the practices that are that particularly come from the the kind of independent um, uh, in-game photography um, captures or or, kind of, or or screenshotting work that that um, that in some cases Ansel has integrated. Um, come from come from photographers that are in the professional photography space. Um, so so people who go through and who do create these images in order to create kind of marketing marketing images. And what's um, so what's kind of fun a little bit is that some of uh, some of Nvidia's early marketing for Ansel um, pushes the kind of kind of side eyes. <laughs> Again, so I think it's confusing. They're not really sure what they want to be. Um, in some cases, they kind of have these these these, these kinds of these kind of side side comments about um, about this being an opportunity for people to create unique images, their own images, images that aren't the official marketing images from these um, from these particular games. But at the same time, they also push the potential com um, uh, uh, commercial um, or professional aspect of of some of these works. Um, some of the features which they integrate in, which are kind of these these, these ultra high resolution features. Um, these, these features that are almost meant for, for people to be able to sell like prints and posters are clear, are kind of clearly targeting um, people who potentially want to um, to have these images be part of the um, I guess the commercial games um, ecosystem or to draw the attention of the game developers to get them to come in um, and you know, create these, these photographs from their from the work of these games. Um, there's also a kind of a um, I wouldn't say it's the most popular, like kind of subgenre of Ansel photography, but there are certainly um, a fair degree of uh, of professional style images. So I talked a little bit more about about amateur photography, which has kind of a traditional separation from uh, from commercial photographic practices. Um, but um, but there's also you know commercial photographic practices that you can see demonstrated clearly in the gallery. So things like car photography, fashion photography. Um, the kind of the styles and aesthetics and, and, and kind of values of those those particular images. So so it's kind of it's, it's, it's interestingly kind of kind of kind of entangled within that particular platform. Uh, but um, 
but when you start to kind of look again at these other sorts of photographies, it's not not necessarily the case. I mean, you can't really look at you know like Robert Overman's photography and say that it's necessarily saying anything um, kind of positive in terms of sale of the of the games in which he's photographing. Um, even um, uh, even um, uh, I forget his name, Raven's work um, from GTA Five. Um, there's a there's a certain subset of it which looks which looks at glitches. Um, you know, other like flaws, errors within that within the work is being kind of these like unique emergent captured um, images, which for photojournalism fits in kind of really well with the spirit of what that that practice has traditionally the shape that that practice has traditionally taken. Um, but um, but wouldn't be something that a commercial a, a game company would be terribly interested in um, in showcasing or, or putting forward. Uh, and I think that that sort of there's, there's this this long been attention between in game photography practices and kind of official game images. I know that when I wrote, when I first wrote that, um, uh, that article on in game photography in 2007, there are no screen captures in it whatsoever um, because they were not official. And I was, I was forbidden from using anything that wasn't official um, within, um, within those, those works. Um, and that's, that was the case with a number of articles I had around that time. Uh, you know, now obviously there's a bit more integration, but also like with, sorry, no, this is taking a long time to answer this question. I'm, so I'm, circ I'm circling. Um, but Anvil does have um, a fair amount of developer control um, placed on what players can actually um, capture from those, from those images. Um, the back end interface allows developers to say how much access they want to shaders, how much, you know, do they want free camera, maybe they don't, maybe they can, they can kind of direct things in, in particular sorts of ways. Um, so they are very invested in having the game show correctly, commercially, in ways it's going to make them more money. That's their value add. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what that is. All right. Thanks a lot. So in the interest of time, I will actually move on and hope to everybody keeps their questions for afterwards, because I would like to plug in um, Winfried's uh, talk as well, because I've already seen like, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it now and maybe we can keep that in mind. I've seen uh, like a connection between the two things uh, like uh, journalism and marketing will, I feel like will also play a role in Winfried's talk. So thanks a lot, Cindy, for now. And um, now we're gonna go over to our next speaker that I'm um, having the pleasure to introduce and who's, um, presentation I'm already firing up uh, at the same time. And as you see, I can only do one thing at a time. So I will <laughs> first fire up the introduction and then fire up the uh, presentation. And then I will introduce uh, Vincy Galling uh, from the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam, who is a, and I, this time I will do it the other way around. I will first introduce a person and then introduce the talk. And um, uh, who is a professor of the concept and aesthetics of new media in the European Media Studies program at the University of uh, Applied Sciences of Potsdam and the University of Potsdam. And his research focuses on the practical and theoretical reflection of photographic media, digital aesthetics, media environments, and uh, media art. And uh, Winfried's claim to fame to be in this talk, there's many claims to fame that I could bring up. But uh, the most important is that uh, he wrote uh, an article. Um, yeah, so I already fired up your slides. I actually wanted to show you my slides where I'm showing the article. Um, uh, an article in 2018 that's called Photography in the Digital. So you're um, where you are actually thinking about or where you're introducing like an idea of like the screen image that's actually ha happening there. And uh, which basically um, touches upon what we do a lot of the times, but we hardly ever think about how many images we are actually taking while we are on our phones, on our desktops, like all the screenshots that we are taking and things like that. And you actually found out or you're finding out that this is like a practice that is of course much older than what we're doing. And, and what you're going to present in your talk today is actually like, this trajectory of like practices related to screen images. And you will, as I know already, um, arrive at in-game photography as like the endpoint of that development. So a uh, very warm welcome to Winfried and um, I'm very much looking forward to your talk and I'll go to the audience now. 
Oh, that's um, nice. So um, I have a little more room. For those two. So it's yeah, this much. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for the introduction and say, thanks a lot for inviting me to that new format at CO. I'm very pleased. Uh, to, to be able to discuss uh, with you today, also with Cindy over the um, ocean. Uh, my talk will be about the images of the screen, the often simplified so-called screenshot, its history, its use, and its aesthetics. Screenshotting is very similar to photographic practices, and I call it photography, of, even though it is in most cases not drawn with light. I would like to start my talk <clears throat> with a case from my own history. In 1991, and now I have to check if this will work. No, it won't. Why? What, what do I have to do? Okay, so it works. In 1991, I was sitting in Grunewaldstraße 2 to 5 in Berlin with Christoph Ulbrich, a fellow student, a front, in front of the monitor of an IBM CAD computer eagerly awaiting the results of the rendering of the 3D simulations of a virtual object or a room created on the computer, which often took nights. In the absence of adequate output devices that could print out the resulting color image, an analog camera was placed on a tripod in front of the screen at night and a slide of the image that appeared on the screen was taken. The respective temporary conclusion of a time-consuming process that should always retain something provisional. Although the so-called screenshot had already been implemented in various computer systems and output uh, as an image format would also have been possible, an old analog practice was used here since it enabled more available, available connections of inexpensive, especially color analog photographic reproduction. So uh, the story begins with a really hybrid practice and it, it is like that in photography. Um, the development of screenshotting is based on the need to be able to immediately capture a moving and sometimes rapidly changing screen image. As such, it is very close to photography as a practice of recording and possibly photography arose from a similar need. Capturing an image that is already an image before it is captured. The matte screen of the camera obscura could have been the occasion for a significant part, a significant part of photographic developments in the 19th century. Michel Frisot speaks in the context of the, in this context of the copy of views in the camera obscura. Indeed, as early as uh, 7th January 1839, Fran Francois Arago stated the following about the invention of the daguerreotype at a meeting of the Academy of Sciences in Paris. Quote, the whole world knows the apparatus called camera obscura or darkroom, whose invention belongs to Porter. The whole world has noticed with what sharpness, with what truth of shape, color and sound, the external objects will be reproduced on the matte screen placed in the front, in the focus of the lens that constitutes the essential part of the instrument. All the world, after ad admiring these pictures, was moved by the regret that they could not be captured. This regret is no longer be, be relevant. M. Daguerre has discovered special plates on which the optical image leaves a perfect imprint, plates on which everything that surrounded the image is reproduced down to the most minute details, which incredibly, with, with incredible accuracy and fineness, quote M. The French protocol equates the matte screen of the camera obscura with a plate that records the image at the place where the matte screen is otherwise located as écran or screen. This appears essential to the argument that the, image, the images were already there and admired before they were recorded. That is before they could be recorded and the plate of the daguerreotype could take their place. Henry Fox Talbot once noted the special speed with which photography was able to record an image, quote, 
However numerous the objects, however complicated the arrangement, the camera depicts them all at once, quote end. In doing so, he also points to, points to the instantaneous, the shot-like nature of photography. Still the screenshot as a digital process is a copy of an image, a representation of digital data, not a photograph taken with a camera that reduces a three-dimensional space to two dimensions. Digital screenshots are pixel exact positive copies of the constellation of program windows found on the respective screen or an actively selected part of it at the moment of the screenshot. The edges are arbitrarily de determined and today the cursor is mostly hidden. They are usually rectangular and have no central perspective characteristics. The screenshot is the capture of a temporary state in the graphical interface. These, this includes different concepts and visualities appearing simultaneously in screenshots, texts, images, software interfaces, 3D simulations, games, etc. With its clear two-dimensional dimensionality, it is closer to the photogram as a form of camera-less photography than to photography. It is noteworthy that some of the earliest attempts to produce photographs were designed as copies. Niepce's first heliographies consisted of contact copies of prints and texts. Talbot was also still experimenting with the direct copying of printed texts and the photography of lithographs. Much like the capturing images of the camera obscura, the copy as a photographic process for the improvement or end or simplification of the printing technique stood at the beginning of the history of photography. In other words, rather than pursuing uh, originality, one of the key goals was to achieve the ability to copy already printed pictures. This two-dimensional practice is thus very close to the pixel-identical pixel copies of the screenshot. Like the photogram, the screenshot is an image on, the, on a scale of one to one and has no perspective characteristics. Unlike optical photography, the screenshot and the photogram do not show a section of potentially infinite elements. Instead, they show an image of elements that are arranged in a special way towards the section even though the chosen section can be very arbitrary. This image is not like the image of a camera. It is not a two-dimensional section of an infinite three-dimensional space. It is not generated by a virtual camera and thus does not originate from an optical paradigm. It is the image of a two-dimensional space whose organization explicitly refers to the visible section. This clearly distinguishes the screenshot from the photograph. Theoretical, theoretically and arithmetically, the space behind the monitor is now infinite and something can be shifted off the screen at any time. In early graphical user interfaces, it was not yet the case. Due to memory limitations, it was impossible to move the windows over the edge of the monitor. The resulting screen photographs and screenshots were fitted into the frame of the monitor in a different way than today. They do not show a supposed detail, but consequently everything that was on the monitor. And they do not refer beyond the, its edge. This figuratively also a testimony, a testimony to the close nature of earlier personal computers, which disappeared in the course of their development due to their networking. In this sense, the screenshot also documents the change, <clears throat> the changes to the systems on which it can be executed. That is from non-network desktop computers and computers with internet access to the, the, today's mobile systems, laptops, tablets, and smartphones into which this function has been integrated. Taking a screenshot is a photographic practice that was implemented as a function in these computers in the early 1980s with the establishment of the personal or home computer. When computers became domestic or computer heimisch worden, it was apparently important to be able to record what was visible on the screens, especially when multitasking arrangements 
appeared in different program windows on the screen. And before the introduction of the screenshot, it was only possible to export image formats from one program at a time, at least as long as it was a graphics or image editing program and never everything appeared on the screen and never everything that appeared on the screen. Screenshots have a photographic prehistory that goes along with the standardization of recording screens, bildschirm photography, or radi radiological luminesc luminescent screens, schirmbild photography. The medical doctor, Manuel de Abreu, used an X-ray machine with a luminescent screen for his examinations. When the machine was running, the moving image of the patient's inner workings appeared on the screen. Capturing the image on an image-sized X-ray film was too costly to use in serial X-ray examinations for thousands of patients. So he found a way to photograph the screen image with a 35 millimeter camera. The image produced cost less than 100 of the screen sized X-ray film, which was a significant advance for the healthcare system. This technology was further developed by Siemens in Brazil and later as Schirmbild photography, it was established in Germany by Siemens under the National Socialist and later worldwide. A somewhat different problem arose when the, with the recording of measuring instruments such as the oscilloscope. Here it was a question of permanently recording graphically uh, displayed measured values. It was a matter of displaying CRT monitors, which in principle, function like computer screens. For this purpose, equipment was developed starting in the 1940s, usually using Polaroid technology to permanently ca capture the volatile signal. Although the standardization of screen photography existed early on, it has limited and it has had limited and permanently saved the image of a temporary reality as a document in order to be able to archive it and communicate it to others. Screen photographs are thus strange hybrids. They create the image of a clear two-dimensional order by means of an optical system, but their excess is materially limited to the surface of the apparatus. This means that they bring the materiality of the screen to view, including curvatures, opacity, scratches, and fingerprints without pointing it out. It is noteworthy that most of these early images were chiefly recorded on Polaroid material. This was due to the fact, oh, sorry. No, I, there's something mixed up. Sorry, I have to show that image. Um, this was due to the fact uh, that such an image was seen more as a copy or backup copy of the image shown on the screen, a copy that could be filed immediately rather than some kind of photographic testimony. In fact, evidence of one of the most formative developments of the 20th century is still available today as a series of small Polaroids, you see them here, photographed by hand, the de development of the Apple Lisa interface at the first and the first graphical programs like QuickDraw was documented by computer scientist Bill Atkinson in roughly 1979 to 1982. If at the beginning of the history of interactive computers, the image of the screen was always shown in the context of its use, a way of testi testifying what these devices that these devices existed and that they enabled important and new processes. This process was completely, was completed in the early 1980s with the introduction of the PC, the first ever entry of the term screenshot in the Oxford Dictionary in 1983 and its integration into the operating systems of Apple, Macintosh in 1984 and other systems as print screen, uh, um, Tasta, um, I don't know. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, <laughs> key also provide evidence of this. It is interesting to note that analog devices were still being developed and now I have to go here. Um, in 1984, to photograph the screen as accurately as possible. 
In the course of the development of the personal computer in the mid 80s, the digital screenshot function was implemented in various operating systems. Whatever is concretely being executed in the computer differs depending on the platform. Simply put, it can be assumed that the screenshot is written from video RAM into a memory or immediately as a file format with corresponding metadata on, storage, on a data storage device. It is not a specifically rendered image, but rather a copy of the image currently generated in the computer that produces a certain form of evidence, including juridical evidence. These are images of layers of windows, programs of the realities on the computer, but also images that allow insights into the private sphere of users. These images, these are images of surface, of a surface rather than of an operative image. They are correspondences of what was on the screen, similar to whatever was on a piece of paper when making a photogram or a copy. They are shadows of a functional relationship that is er erased at the moment of the shot. The index of the operative image, image points to something different than a screenshot of the same screen constellation. While the symbols, icons, and menus, etc., um, always refer to operations available in the computer. The screenshot refers to the use of the computer, the culture with it, to intimacy, et cetera. The difference between these two images, which appear so confusingly similar, lies in the decision to create a screenshot. In our image culture, and now it's really, there's something, I know, <laughs> sorry, that's what I tried to show. Uh, in our image culture, it is otherwise impossible to create the image of an object or situation that is like it. As Philip Dubois noted, uh, quote, with a photographic index, the sign is never the thing. Even in the photogram where the real object is spatially closest to its image, since it's, it is literally placed in the light sensitive paper, this extreme proximity is never an identification. Identification, uh, quote ends. The screenshot is the first is first understood as a reality as it was on the computer screen or on the screen of my computer, pixel identical. It's a strange confusion with reality which could never occur in a photograph. Indeed, it is possible that the screenshot is the only image of an object that can be confused with uh, that object at least for a short time. Deprived of the operat operativity of the interface image, the screenshot is like a photogram, but more like a shadow or the back of the image. This becomes particularly clear when, per when a person tries to operate in the screenshot as they would in the interface. In this sense, the screenshot is perhaps the best way or the best example of what Charles and his peers called similes. In his theory of science, uh, of what is repeatedly cited in the context of indexicality of photographs, namely that they correspond point to point, point by point to the original. The screenshot thus has a different reference than digital photographs, which use a sensor to convert reflected light into measured values that can potentially be stored as charges. In the screenshot, there's a transfer of charges that are identical to what was in the graphics processor. This is the peculiar, peculiarity of these pictures. They are pixel identical copies of the pictorial reality that was shown on the computer. The decisive moment is therefore the moment in which the image is detached from the monitor. From out of, the, of a process of fluid charges, a permanent charge is generated in the accumulator, in this case, as a latent image. This detachment as magical transfer between reality and representation does not take place in the screenshot as in photography, though observe, through observational distance and inscription of light, but is to be described as one which proceeds in, the, in terms of proximate, proximal engagement with reality rather than a distanced observation which operates through intervention rather than reflection. 
The screenshot is in this sense an intervention that switches an electrical contact between the display and the storage, thus establishing yet another indexical relation. It is closely related to the reality of its producers, which today is decisively, decisively shaped by perceptions on the screen. The world on the screen is no longer a virtual reality, but a complex digital reality. The opportunities to take screenshots are so varied that they can only be reproduced, reproduced incompletely here. Screenshots serve the spontaneous recording and communication of many things, including the following recipes, instructions, tutorials, topo topographic notes, and so on. I don't want to tell them all, uh, but I recognize now at the moment because there was something mixed up. Um, yeah, but something is missing. That's not a problem. Okay, <laughs> so so um, uh, we we have uh, those um, categories and functions. Screenshots also stage, curate, arrange, and document digital mediated content. They often serve as a basis for further processing, like memes and influencing, like fakes. The functions of screenshots are essentially to act as visual notes, reminders, communication aids, inspirations, idea collections, archiving, and evidence. Screenshots play a particular role in digitality, in digitally created realities. Indeed, screenshots are particularly suited to capturing states of moving 3D simulations. This plays a role in the context of architecture simulations, but also especially in the constantly changing environment of computer games. This, the possibility to capture a certain game state as a screenshot already existed with the introduction of this function in the operating system. These screenshots always contain the interface of the respective game and tend to ref reference or document a culture of playing rather than prioritize any form of photographic expression. The history um, of photographic recording in computer games begins with the possibility of recording played, recording played games by means of a virtual camera, a simulated photography. Since many games are played from a first person perspective and thus the image to be played appears as an image from a virtual camera of this perspective, the generation of the game scene is already subject to a photographic paradigm. It follows the laws of central perspective. In games, therefore, shooting and photography have an indistinguishable perspective. Photorealism is uh, the declared goal of virtual realities that got their start with the history of the flight simulator. This is a realism that aims to create images that are indistinguishably indistinguishable from photographs, which includes simulating per certain analog photographic effects, such as lens flares, geometric distortion, motion blur, etc. Confusing this game photos with reality is different from confusing the screenshot with the interface. The confusion here lies on the level of simulation, namely a double simulation. As photography simulates a view of the world, in-game photography already simulates a simulation. The practices of screenshots and photography in computer games must therefore be distinguished in the application and function. The screenshot is used in, to a greater extent in service of the spontaneous recording or documentation of the temporary state of the game, the recording of the setting in the program, evidence of a glitch, a score, etc. It is also used to point out defi de deficiencies in the system. Photographing with a simulated camera technology in a computer game is motivated by, more by a photographic activity. The capture of a special motif, a situation, or seen in this photographic perfection, as uh, Cindy showed uh, the photo mode of Ansel is one example for that. With this motivation, photographing with so-called photo modes is no longer a transformative playing and takes leave to the screenshot. The current boom in computer game photography started from the screenshot, but it shows an image generated by the computer. 
the game engine and no longer the image of the screen. All references to the screen become invisible. In the context of social media, the screenshot, regardless if taken on the, on the desktop, desktop surface or of a personal computer or computer game, is currently experiences, experiencing a boom. This draws attention to its function as a provider of evidence and documentation. Many social media posts are designed to disappear, be deleted and modified, and many are not primarily supposed to be stored or made public in the first place, such as in Snapchat, Telegram, and WhatsApp. Today, however, these media have become a key part of social and political communication, and thus our reality. In this respect, screenshots will always play an important role in documenting what has been said, shown, or done, and may be withdrawn from access shortly afterwards. Some of these posts then become media events and, and in their own right, thanks to screenshots used as a form of quote. In turn, it is possible for these screenshots to circulate like photographs in media, in print media, television, and on the internet, where they are no longer addressed as posts in the respective platform. This always entails a question of credibility since the respective quotation is difficult to validate and can possibly only be verified with the help of other forms of testimony. The screencast has established itself as a further development of the screenshot. Screencasts make it possible to record moving screen images on computers and is especially used for instructional videos featuring audio commentary in the gamer community, but also to circumvent legal or technical restrictions that arise when downloading videos. Today, the number of desktop documentaries and desktop movies has, have also been made mostly in the horror, game, horror genre. These films take advantage of the irritation you feel when you recognize that the first surface of a computer or your computer is being moved by someone else's hand. This effect is especially shocking when these films are viewed on surfaces of one's own laptop where this potentially hostile takeover um, is particularly event, evident as a threat. Now I left leave something uh, to make it a little shorter. The screenshot has taken a new turn with the proliferation of smartphones. Smartphones are network powerful small computers that can also make phone calls. A variety of sensory technologies are integrated into them, the most attentive of which is, light is the light-sensitive photosensor. In this respect, smartphones combine technologies that are so fundamental to the perspective presented here. Their use leads to, a new, to new hybrid forms of screenshot and screen image. A simple, com simple combination of keys can be used to produce a screenshot just as on a conventional computer. And the communication between two smartphone users or owners, however, a new old practice can be observed again and again, taking a picture of the other user's display. It is often quicker to take a photo than to send a message or a screenshot. To save an address from chat history, a digital photo is simply taken, which like the screenshot now often replaces the written note. But intimacy or privacy and the public sphere, which always collide on these surfaces, are mixed in interesting ways. Okay, this was Kevin B. Lee. I forgot that. It's a screenshot from his desktop documentary. And uh, this is Jeff Mermelstein, NYC. Um, the moment it is observed or secured by another party, a private message becomes part of a public communication. In this way, something is often communicated that was not intended. The phone number of the grandmother, one's own whereabouts or the like. What I intended to show here is that pictures from screens from various reasons are always pictures before they are captured. They are images that contain and reference images, that is, second order images or in the computer game, possibly even third order images, since the image of the computer game already refer to images before they are, all, are created 
and then again captured so like you can see here and again gta and Alan Butler, 26 gasoline stations, which shows that the, the images of Ed Rocher might be something like uh, the people who created the game had seen before and put it in the game. And now Alan Butler is coming and taking it out. So it's, it's what I would argue third order images. Computer game screen images and screenshots are images about images about images that can can sometimes contain images. Thanks a lot. And somehow I left a very important part out, namely that one that was about, I don't know, the, there's a a page missing <laughs> here or I just oh yeah I, I just did you drop it I, I just uh, left it so uh, it was about the the idea of um, that also TV images were at, for, at first communicated via photography which is really important because we always think or talk about them like if they were the um, um, the, the, re the recording of that image on a, a, on a cathode ray cube, but it's an image of an image. And also the introduction of um, images of computers um, had a history uh, which had to do with the early 60s, just to, to tell the public that there are these kind of computers and you had always like people around that computers before you have the images of the screens of that computers. So I left that out. Sorry for that. I dropped it. I don't know why. I should have recognized it when I came through the images, but sometimes it's like that. So I go back to maybe. What's that? Oh, that's oh, that's mine. So. Oh, that's the screen that's calling. So it's it's the screen, and maybe we we stay here. Because can, can we say thank you? <laughs> so in the in, so it's uh, I don't know from where you're watching, but in Berlin it's already dark outside and it's quite late. So um, I have the impression I might um, not make this too long actually, but um, we will still um, have time for some questions. So I'm asking for the chat: Is there a question directed at Winfried? And maybe. Cindy, maybe you yeah. also would wish to come back on, and I hope we can see the two of us, or maybe it will change swap in in the in the Twitch, but we will see. So one uh, question directed at Winfried's talk, maybe is there one in the chat? No. Not. Oh, and the, okay, that we will take in a minute. But uh, the thing is also, we have quite a delay online. So the questions might actually come in later, but we don't know. Is there a question in the room that would like to be asked? Yes. Uh, thank you, firstly, very much for this very interesting topic, especially from uh, sort of functionality points of view to talk about screenshot and uh, screenshot. Technology. And uh, we were actually talking about this um, <laughs> question during the first uh, lecture by uh, Mrs. Uh, Paramba. <laughs> and so to what extent do you think that uh, screen photography is a practice of photography? Because um, especially when it comes to photojournalism, you know, it's about setting well in a practice in a, in a very strict sense uh what it means is about setting up a really good record with your protagonist and uh, you know uh, taking the good camera or taking the right camera and uh, all these technical issues and of course uh, all the way down to setting up the exhibition and about hanging and uh you know and um, yeah to what extent do you think that uh Screenshot photography can be counted as photography. And, uh, and my second question is that um, to what extent can you attribute the um, a quality of picture to either to the graphic designer or to the people which who are taking the pictures? 
because as we said, there are already images in the computer games and what they are doing is simply finding the right uh, angles and taking the pictures. Um, just briefly, I'm, I'm not sure if I, Cindy, could you hear the question well, just to check if the audience was able to hear the question, otherwise I will have to repeat it. Actually, I could hear it fairly well. Okay, well then yeah. maybe we'll, we'll take the question, I hope you remember it. Uh, the first part I remember. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I think it's it's really difficult because it's so many different practices and some of them are reflexive practices and they think about what these kinds of images are and sometimes it's like uh, yeah advertisement for for um, for the, the games. But I think what is really interesting, and I wouldn't call it journalism, I rather would call it kind of documentary, mm -hmm. because uh, when Alan Butler is photographing um, homeless people in uh, GTA, it's not about homeless people in GTA, but it, it's about the people who made the game and who gave them agency or not. And that is more about uh, the, the kind of how the game is made and not about what is seen on the screen. It is about what is seen on the screen, but as I, I had shown maybe with the images of Ed Rouché, there's something in mind before the, the, um, the images or the, the games were created. And so it's about the people who are somehow also about the people who are uh, creating the games and it's not only an advertisement about the game but it's a reflexive practice so I would say it depends on what someone is doing with the camera in front of the computer or with a screenshot so there are really uh, I, I can't um, say it as a uh, collective practice also because it's really different and if uh, I, I shown the image of uh, Colio uh, still borrowing postcards which are uh, um, really interesting <laughs> I like a lot and it's about the the the, the um, idea of having nice images from uh, computer games but also nice images from reality and it's Italy and it's so uh, and now they are also um, blown up with AI, these images uh, by, by Colio. And it's interesting what happens in this change from the images from the screen where, when they are thrown to, to an AI machine. So it's a lot of mixed practices around that. And, and I, I would say it's, uh, it's um, yeah, somehow difficult to, to answer that question with one answer because we had to talk about the cases and not about it in general. Maybe for that, Cindy's approach with speaking of photographies, yeah. like is, is, is probably really uh, doing it some justice actually to say like, maybe, I don't know, maybe is there, um, um, is there also some screenshotteries does that uh, apply as well, <laughs> or is that is photography is a screenshot actually uh, part of uh, photographies? That would be a question. I think that the second question that you were asking that uh, probably um, I can I will open up um, yeah. now for 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 all of us and to ask is that I think that was addressed to to basically both of you actually to Cindy and to Winfried the question if um, um, you, you, meant, you named them third order images uh, that the uh, in-game photographs are actually always already images of images even and you just said it and I think I had I was I had the same thought uh, specifically with Grand Theft Auto 5 because it's it's really fascinating how it, it looks I mean good things always look easy but are hard to make right but um, there's like there's like uh, photographs um, or also um, how do you say that uh, repetitions of real world photographs that are made in Grand Theft Auto that look so stunningly similar to the things that they actually try to imitate that you wonder why and obviously this um, this might be one one reason for it because like the whole world of Grand Theft Auto has probably been uh, modeled already according to specific images of, of how the US looks and also the photographs integrated in the game, like uh, the, the murals or things like that were sometimes photographed and integrated in, in the game. So 
it's also a mix up of, of different ideas of images. Cindy, <laughs> Cindy, <laughs> we don't force you. You don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that was really. I mean, it's a great, a great way to close to close your talk with the extended chain of images, images, images. Um, and it reminded me too, too of like the uh, like one of the things that I've been trying to trace as well is like what the what the image is of, right? Um, and like in particular. Like I think that a lot of the um, a lot of the Ansel images are they're they're better framed and better thought of as as in a lot of cases like images they're images of optimal versions of game of of games as opposed to gameplay images um, and they're often and those two things are often kind of kind of flattened. I mean, you have some practitioners that go around. And you know they'll use like an in-game, an in-game camera. You know, like the, um, the one project from, from GTA Five is a good example. Good example of that, where it's the camera system is kind of built into the game, and you know they're they're within a game build taking images of that to, of that game. Uh, but you know, I mean, most most other ones uh, are are going outside of the game build, or they're being they're using interfaces that hook into things that are typically not experienceable in a game build overall. And I think that, um, uh, I'm not gonna remember the name, or I hate, I hate giving quasi quotes and I don't remember the name of the person who said it. Um, but uh, I had one quote that where somebody had talked about, you know, the image, the image that you get is entirely contingent to the system that the game is running in and the amount of access that somebody has to the game as built as designed, not as the game as as played. So um, like so kind of getting getting into the guts to, to like take pictures of um, like things that like integrate custom custom integrate and adjust custom shaders or like detach a camera from a from a particular character, um, like that's those ostensibly aren't images of the game. I mean, they're not Im images of the gameplay, right? They're images of the thing that produced the game. <laughs> um, so I think that that's like the like kind of breaking down like what what exactly the picture is of, and it, 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 that becomes contentious as well. I mean, there's countless examples of, of you know fan communities. For games that have got all, all up in arms because they're dealing with like in-engine images um, from um, from games that aren't that don't look the same as the game build, right? Um, you know, once the game is released, it, it goes through these like sort of optimizations, and you know, it's run, you know, it's playable on computer systems that aren't the computers, you know, the super high-end computer systems that are that they're, they're, not, they're developed on, um, because like those because um, those systems are. Are producing the the images as the you know in, in particular contexts as well, right? So um, you know they're photographs of images that in some cases are being emergently produced on individual systems for a particular person, uh, as opposed to like, just thinking of them as being like photographs, right? Hmm. Thank you. More questions. There's one from Jana. Oh, that's one from the from the stream. Okay. Hello, stream. We're happy that you're with us. Yeah, so uh, the first one is uh, very interesting. Um, Super says, thanks for your talk. Uh, are there faithful media practices at play other than social media? Okay, so the question, I don't know. Did you hear the question well? So that was uh, directed to you, Cindy. Thank you for your talk. Are there, and that's uh, directed at your talk, are there potentially also other media practices at play, if I understand correctly, than photography in the things that you were showing us? I don't know where um, what this is um, aiming at, but um, that is the question. <laughs> um, I mean, I would, I would imagine so. I mean, those aren't, uh, but there's certain, I mean, at a certain point, you have 
you have to imagine that somebody who's contributed an image to like the Chapman G Force Gallery is is is, is playing the game <laughs> of like Ansel or Ansel photography. Um, there's there's really no reason for them to to have participated that extensively in it without having done it. Um, that doesn't mean that you couldn't go through and potentially troll it, which would be um, potentially a fun art project. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean I. Um, like I, even even within certain practices, like if you think of the photojournalism practice, you can see different um, different purposes and different intentions in terms of what people are, are exploring. There are at least like two examples there that were coming kind of more from a fine art context, and again, exploring different things within that context. You know, exploring um, things like like re, like remediation, recreation, differences between kind of analog and physical photography. Um, uh, you know, examining um, kind of kind of in, in, instancing you know, kind of performance practices. Uh, there is the, uh, I mean, the um, uh, the, in, the integration of quote unquote real photographers into virtual spaces, I feel is just is something that like, every five years, somebody thinks it's gonna sell a newspaper. So, <laughs> so it ends up kind of popping, um, popping up um, time and time, you know, in different, in different sorts of contexts. Um, and it's not just centered around conflict photography. There's, I could have brought in other examples of, uh, um, of that of that model of like, bringing in a real photographer to take pictures of landscapes or to pictures of different of different sorts of games. Um, recently, it has. Um, I mean, there's at least I think three different good examples of um, of that idea being used for promotional purposes um, for um, which is specifically to market um, particular games. And the underlying rhetoric in that case is often to, to, to showcase or to talk up how fully realistic those environments uh, are almost exclusively. I can't think of another incentive um, that has come up so far, but, but of course, another would be when you know, they emerge, um, they emerge at, different, at different times. Um, some of these images also do a pretty, this is, this is would be an entirely different talk, but some of these images also do a really interesting job of, of crossing into different kind of like episodic contexts. So um, you know they start out as promotional photos, but they end up at an art gallery. Um, it would be kind of a, just a, a, loose, a loose example. Um, and I don't know. I've always been, I've been always been interested in pieces that do move between spaces in this way, and how that affects um, how they're read, how they're, uh, how they're understood uh, uh, overall. Because you know, um, it, it often. In, you know, alpha within the same work, just just that position of walking changes what uh, uh, what it's doing and how it can kind of loosely be understood. Thank you. Maybe one or two. There's one in the audience. There's one in the chat. I don't know if we can we take one from the audience. Uh, so um, once again, I have a question. It might be relevant for both uh, speakers. Because, um, like, Cindy talked a lot about, uh, um, you know, talked a lot about um, drawing like these moments from chaos, right? To kind of make photography, which is like this, this, this capturing something which is only chaotic and it might not be like a photographer of a photographer also, which relates to the to the stuff that uh, when Magali said that he was talking about, um, like. The first photographs that kind of um what, what was this uh said like an incredibly aggressive capturing the state which is like not like a kid chaos at all right as are all digital um like objects they are not chaotic at all they are highly structured highly ordered as is the case with uh with, with video games so um I wonder, like, and so this this little bit wrote it like this more like advanced that kind of photography, right? When a, when a photographer has like all this control and gets this more advanced uh, control over all the so I wonder, like, and like how control relates into this theory of, of, of digital photography, especially with like thinking about the people controlling the machine, like people that don't seem to have uh, more actually kind of. Are the inputs for the machine in which are and then kind of often yeah, expected with this graphical information, which might also uh, uh, give uh, a hint to like much, much, much more information below and which then kind of relates to kind of I think of what would you do with like the surveillance effect of, of, of screenshots and of uh of, of digital photography as they kind of create this, yeah, 
representation of the very controlled um, um, controlled state, which is very clearly defined, and that's actually all fast one in like the like a photograph. So maybe just to have it like shortly, <laughs> like how, how how does control uh, relates to um, digital photography? Just okay. Just brief question, Cindy. Did you understand the question, or should we repeat? Um, I mean, it's, I have to say that it's the, the bassier voices that are that are uh, real fuzzy on the on the microphone. Um, I did, I, I did catch um, questions about um, about control. Yeah. Okay. So no, and then I can I can repeat it again, but I would first address it uh, to Winfried, and then I will uh, give the word to you. So the question is about like basically what is the so we've seen that in all the screen images practices, uh, like control seems to play some kind of role, and uh, also Cindy has like uh, talked about like um, that in-game photography is also one way of uh, um, getting order into noise, uh, in, into um, the noise of like the gameplay uh, that's going on. And the question is like, what, where, where do you see like the role of control in, uh, I guess, screen images then as well, or the history of screen images. And then also for Cindy, uh, for computer games, or maybe you can also <laughs> address. It's, it's again, a very big question because uh, if you think about the screen images and control, it was about having control to a fluent image, which is gone after you had seen it. So you had to, to, to do that. So it was, uh, so th this, I, I think it was uh, an attempt to control these images. Uh, but uh, when you think about um, computer game photography or computer game screenshots, there, I would say two, two, two really different practices. The one is the screenshot while you are playing and while you are attacked by others and you have to kill people around you to take a photograph of a place special or something. You are under pressure. And this is, is not under your control, I would say, or you try to control. Uh, and, and you make a screenshot and, and then you have problems maybe with the game. So, and uh, the photo mode is total control of everything. You stop the game, you you went out of the, uh, the play and, you can move in, in the world like it's a 3D, it is a 3D model of an architecture of a landscape or something else. You can control it. And it's a different, uh, I, I think, uh, also view on a world if you control it like that. And all, also the simul simulation of all that photographic stuff, I think it's not necessary. It's just a reference to something which everybody knows who, who, who uses these kind of techniques, but uh, I think it, it is about control. So your question is <laughs> photography uh, in, in, the, in the photo mode is especially is about control. Uh, maybe one aspect, but there are a lot of others. I didn't talk about uh, surveillance and so on, but maybe Cindy has another idea to that. <laughs> Um, I don't. I was going to just um, kind of move uh, or just uh, answer fairly fairly quickly. I mean, I think that I mean the, the lens of control is a really interesting one, particularly when you start getting in these kinds of intermingled agencies, like like for example, like how much control Nvidia has over the, the images that you take with uh, with Ansel. How, how much control a particular video game. Um, uh, creator has over the, uh, the the photos you can take within it, but also just like um, different um, different kinds of um, people position themselves differently in re in kind of relation in relation to control. So like with the examples I was showing with photojournalism, um, one of the one of the things that when you kind of read accounts of some of those projects, one of the things that often comes up is the is the need for some degree of lack of control in order to reperform that that style of, of, of photography um, in order to kind of create in order to again to kind of to be able to pull pull that like for lack of better words decisive decisive moment out of out of chaos um, in a way that sort of um, that meets some of the goals and desires of that of that genre of photography um, when you when you move into um, photo modes, you know, particularly with things like Ansel, um, and where they integrate things like free camera that you wouldn't 
normally see or get within a gameplay experience, then um, then it is largely about you know, being able to, to have that control over composition, framing, to be able to kind of move into um, ways of, of composing that image in, in, uh, in ways that, that um, uh, a creator would, would particularly want to, to, to pull forward and not necessarily, necessarily be limited. So that, and that's obviously privileging the image creation as opposed to perhaps, like for example, that it have less, less of a tie to the truthfulness of what is being um, what is being portrayed. Like some of the projects where people are using in-game cameras do have it, it, it's not an explicit rhetoric, this implicit rhetoric of well, I'm you know I'm trying to maintain more indexicality between the games played and what you know what a photograph would look like if it was created in game environment. And they get kind of get deeper in that. Um, there's also, and I didn't talk about this explicitly, but you know, some some genres um, which don't appear often, but like for example, you take like in-game portraiture, and um, particularly self-portraiture and self-representation. A lot of those, um, a lot of the artists that, that are kind of most prominent in those areas work in things like Second Life, um, and my theory is that they work they work in in thing, in environments like that so that they have more direct control over self-representation within those um, those spaces. So, um, so yeah, the, um, that's a, a fascinating lens to look at these, um, at these images. So with there's different, different ways that it plays out um, in terms of um, the field kind of very specific hardware context, skills, like in soft, software context, probably more software than hardware. Um, uh, but then also just in terms of like representational imperatives for different types of images. All right, thanks a lot. So. I know that there are more questions to be asked. I think I have noted at least like 15 questions and I can impossibly, <laughs> it's not possible to ask these questions tonight, but I can keep them in mind. And I hope everyone who joined us on the stream and here in person will also keep their questions in mind because the endeavor of researching in-game photography is not over. It has hardly started. So um, there will be other occasions when we will be able to get together again and uh, talk about these questions and trying to find answers. So thanks a lot, Cindy and Winfried, for your contributions to, I, I was saying tonight, but for Cindy, it's uh, <laughs> today. <laughs> it's is, fine afternoon. It's, yeah. It's, uh, I love that. I, I find it amazing that this is possible. Thanks again. And thanks a lot for everyone here. Thanks uh, everyone in the stream. The next workshop will be on October 24th. We will inform about that in due time on our pages. And um, thanks and see you soon.